That's an overhead shot of Tampa Bay. So we're going to look at our Tampa Bay ecosystem and local ecosystems in general. Uh, you can see Tampa Bay is a shallow water estuary receiving input from the Hillsborough River and other uh, streams, as well as runoff directly from land. Uh, it receives water from Pinellas uh, and then Hillsborough, Pasco, Manatee, Polk. The uh, entire area drains into what's called a watershed and that empties into Tampa Bay. An estuary is a body of water where fresh water gets mixed with salt water. Uh, it's so if the open ocean is around 35 parts per thousand, brackish water is not that salty, but there's a range between uh, almost pure fresh water to uh, pure salt water that the brackish can fall in depending on whether you're getting more uh, ocean influence or more uh, freshwater influence. So it, there's no set number for brackish water. Uh, the first type of estuaries that we look at are the spring-fed estuaries. Florida is that karst topography we mentioned. The uh, limestone, limestone uh, gets dissolved by uh, slightly acidic water. Uh, we do have an extensive aquifer where the uh, limestone dips below the water table. The aquifer flows out of, uh, giving us springs. Uh, those springs uh, feed into the Gulf or Tampa Bay. And uh, so those are spring-fed estuaries. They maintain a consistent temperature. So things like manatees love them in the winter when the Gulf temperatures drop below 70 degrees. Um, now our coastal estuaries are the transition from fresh to salt water. We visit or you have visited or will be visiting very shortly Lake Megory. And uh, so Lake Megory is an old sinkhole that is uh, an estuary. It gets contribution from Tampa Bay through Salt Creek. Uh, the Lake Megory itself is 380 acres and it's an important body of brackish water. It's a resource for wildlife migrating birds. Uh, around it you have Willow Marsh. Uh, Willow Marsh, uh, usually it's named after uh, its major plant species, so uh, willows are the uh, major plant species in the willow marsh. A lot of uh, epiphytes and uh, a lot of uh, the plants that grow in aquatic, we call that hydric situations. The swamps and the swamp woodlands are cypress, uh, that's one type, mangrove is another type, and Megory has both, but the swamp woodlands is a cypress swamp uh, coming off of uh, Lake Megory. Uh, you can see those cypresses have what we call knees because they grow in loose and anoxic sediment. I was taught in college that they were to help aerate the soil. I've also read that they anchor the plants into the soil. The uh, cypress is a coniferous tree and it's losing its needles. It's the only one that loses its needles uh, seasonally, hence its term bald. Another common tree is the red maple, which likes these uh, moist soils. Uh, the pine flatwoods is uh, a more uh, mesic to xeric uh, area, a lot drier. Uh, pine trees are the uh, major species and uh, it's a fire ecosystem. So barrier islands can have uh, the more hydric soil closer to the water and then as you move up the crown they can have more xeric soil with pine flatwoods. Now the sand scrub used to cover most of Florida or, or our area at least because 12,000 years ago we were the center of the state and so we were a huge scrubland. Today very little of it exists 
uh, sea level change, Florida's changes habitats. Uh, there is some uh, dune relics, which, which is sand scrub, uh, at Boyd Hill uh, in the center loop area. The hammock means forested habitat, uh, and we visited the hammocks and talked about these uh, maritime forests. Now there's the Tampa Bay Estuary, and as you can see, Pasco, Polk, Manatee, little bit of Sarasota, not much, Pinellas and Hillsborough, all supply Tampa Bay with fresh water and unfortunately with pollutants. Uh, so whatever happens in that watershed winds up impacting our bay. Uh, Barrier Islands, which is the depositional habitat, you can see from the map, span all the way around the east coast of the United States and through the Gulf. Uh, they are deposits left over from the end of the last ice age. The habitat starts near shore, then beach. The beach is always on the ocean or Gulf side because of the higher energy. Dunes behind the beach held together by plants. The uh, flats behind it, which we have scrub, but some places have salt marsh. It just depends on the habitats. Uh, then we have a highland, which is our maritime forest. Then more flats, more scrub. Then our tidal flat, where we get wet, that's what we hike through at Arrowhead, mud flat, salt marsh, mangrove. And finally, that shallow estuary and lagoon with the sea grasses and oyster beds. We hike through that as well at the Arrowhead. So that is the dynamics of the barrier island our main coastal estuary. We have bar-built estuaries here. We have a couple of river mouths, so we do have river estuaries, but most of our estuaries are bar-built behind a sandbar. Uh, so the first zone is uh, the near, near shore, near shore bars, uh, slightly raised underwater embankments where the waves break. Sometimes they are above water, sometimes they're underwater. We have studied the beaches. We know that there's the foreshore, the uh, rack line, and then the back shore. We also know that dunes wrap up the beach, held together by plants. Sand is fed there via sea breeze. Uh, the, le the littoral zone is between the tides, so beaches are uh, a littoral zone uh, area. Uh, so, and we learned about the foreshore, back shore. Uh, the scarp or rack line uh, from our beach profiles. Uh, protected bays uh, have smaller sediments, fine. Even mud, where open coasts and the higher energy, the larger the beach sediments. Uh, the parts of the beach that we, we've seen, the, the crest is the top of the berm. The uh, face is the slope leading down to the water, and the trough is carved by waves. There's your rack line. That is debris between the foreshore and the backshore. There's the dunes held together, in this case, by sea oats. They are windswept, but held together by vegetation. Behind that, the barrier flats, the scrub, the dune flats, uh, typical palm, sea grapes, palmetto, beach scrub. Behind there, you can find your salt meadows or salterns, as they're called, little depressions. Uh, they become too salty for uh, they become too salty for trees, so only super salt tolerant. Plants can grow there. Uh, so we get the uh, seaside purslane and little stunted, uh, stunted plants uh, growing there. Uh, it's a harsh environment. The upland, the maritime forest, we have the different oaks, the different pines, cedar tends to be a little drier. There's understory and it's fire dependent. We've covered that quite extensively in this course. Our mangrove communities 
Uh, button and whites are associated with each other. The black and then finally the red mangroves grow the furthest out. You can see by that illustration there how they, uh, as you approach the salt water, that's each zone. So each mangrove has its own zone in the mangrove swamp. Uh, there is the water's edge with the red mangrove with the prop roots extending from the branches down, trapping sediment, providing habitat for estuary uh, creatures. The black mangrove is generally found a little bit behind the water line, mixed with reds, but you know, it has this distinct area where it becomes more uh, black mangrove, less red mangrove, a uh, little drier area. It does receive daily tidal surge, but it's in the back of the tidal basin. The uh, furthest on the back is the white mangroves, and we've said the word nectaries a lot, and there's a brilliant picture of nectaries right there, uh, showing you those special structures that our friends, the white mangroves, uh, sport to help with their uh, ion balance. So then the buttonwoods, there's our buttonwoods. They uh, are associated with the uh, white mangrove and mangrove communities, but a lot of, uh, you know, most do not call that a mangrove because it lacks that special structure for uh, salt removal. Now our salt marshes and mudflats are in association with each other. You can see how the low marsh has the higher plants, gets more tidal influence. The mudflats are even lower on the zone than the uh, tidal marsh. They only occasionally are uh, exposed. And then the high marsh gets very little inundation and they have the smaller uh, plants. Salt marshes uh, occur all up and down the Atlantic and Eastern seaboard. Uh, we start losing them in favor of the mangroves. And then the further south you go, the less salt marsh you get and the more mangrove you get. So we're right on that zone where we get uh, a mix of salt marsh and mangrove. <clears throat> uh, the wildlife associated with it, birds, uh, you know, in the back of them, where it's, uh, you get a lot of freshwater influence, you get the alligator, the diamondback terrapin, uh, salt marsh snakes, uh, you get more maritime organisms like redfish, snook, uh, in the front of it, and then the gastropods and uh, fiddler crabs and suspension feeders throughout. So it just depends on where you are in the salt marsh zone as to what organisms you find. Uh, some of the, there's a, a marsh snake and the diamondback terrapin, fiddler crab, and in the back marsh, you got your alligators. Uh, so uh, you got a, a very um, diverse habitat in the salt marshes. The vegetation, dominant, Spartina. Other coast, up a little bit, needle rush joins it. Uh, you huge salt marsh meadows, Jacksonville, those areas don't have a mangrove anywhere, it's too cold. They have miles upon miles of salt marsh. So uh, you start getting more diversity in the marsh grasses. There's our smooth cord grass or Spartina. This is Fort DeSoto Arrowhead. Uh, Pan is a salt pond surrounded in salt marsh areas. It's called a pan. So it's a special habitat similar to a tide pool in a rocky coastline. Tide pool in a beachy, it's a pan when it's salt marsh. Uh, very important for sewage treatment because nutrients are absorbed in these salt marshes. So salt marshes are erosion preventers, storm surge, uh, they, they help against storm surge, they provide habitat, they're used in water treatment, uh, so they're very important uh, habitats. 
The mud flats are a little lower than those salt marshes. Uh, they're protected. They're, they're, they're uh, protected in bays and estuaries. They're not common in, in, in open water because the mud sediments are too, uh, too light and they get washed away. Uh, clams, a lot of uh, in-fauna burying uh, creatures. And then the birds love to hunt the mud flats. Uh, so there's a uh, mud flat at low tide. Uh, you can see all, all the snails. That is perfect for uh, hunting on, on the wading birds. They walk on the mud flats and uh, eat all day. Uh, spoil islands, we talked about spoil islands, uh, made by dredging out the intercoastals. During uh, World War II, we dredged out the intercoastals to prevent uh, German U-boats from bombing our, our ships, our trade ships, so we could have protected waterways from submarines. Uh, you can monitor and, and, and so on in, in an intercoastal. Uh, now their recreation, and with all those islands that were dredged, our spoil islands, they've undergone succession in their habitat for wildlife or parks for people. Below the tides is called the subtidal zone. So the intertidal or littoral zone gives way to the subtidal zone that's always underwater. It's far more stable habitat because you don't have fresh, as much fresh water influence. You don't have it air, water, air, water. So uh, it's very uh, stable, large diversity because conditions are stable. Uh, oyster zones, oyster zones, they are filter feeders. We use them because they're easy to cultivate uh, to help clean water and stop coastal erosion. Uh, our intracoastal, our subtitle, they're always under the water. It's between the barrier island and the mainland, but they're estuaries. They are brackish. Oyster bars are also common. We made the oyster domes. These guys cover, you can see that salt marsh and then the oysters in front of it. That is erosion abatement. Uh, we, uh, that's, you know, the fish, the, such as the sheep's head and the drum. Uh, love these areas. They're great habitats. We use oyster domes. You can see there's an unused one and a used one to help grow these oyster beds to reduce erosion and provide habitat. Tampa Bay Watch, a local nonprofit, uh, takes volunteers and they build oyster domes and deploy them with volunteer workers. So our seagrass beds in the intracoastals, uh, we've covered them. Right there, we have a picture of the turtle grass. That is one of our important seagrass species here in Tampa Bay. So seagrasses do belong to Kingdom Plantae. They flower underwater. They have pollen underwater. Their seeds are transported by currents underwater. They're fully submerged and live a full life. Uh, you can see by this illustration, their stem is under the sediments. The roots are under the sediments, but the leaves pop up. We have seven species in Florida. The three with asterisks are our Tampa Bay species. The other ones, not common in Tampa Bay. On the shoal grass, the manatee grass, and the turtle grass. We've studied them, you've seen images. By now you've been out in the field and you've had your hands on them. So these three grasses are important. They are the uh, linchpin of the seagrass community. They are isotonic, meaning they, they, they do not need to get rid of ions. They live in a full salty environment. They function normally. They have a well-developed anchoring system. Their reproductive cycle is fully intact when submerged. So they pretty much are the only oceanic submergent vegetation from Kingdom Plantae. We have a couple of emergents, mangroves, 
salt marshes, but they are the only submergent group of plants. Uh, they're very important because they uh, feed manatees, feed turtles, nesting habitats for uh, fish and snails. Uh, so they're, they're very, very important. They trap sediments. They uh, provide oxygen to the water. Uh, ecologically, very important communities. A couple of images from, from the seagrass. Uh, dugong, manatees, uh, depending on where you are. We, we get the manatees here, dugongs in Australia. Seagrasses are a cosmopolitan group of plants uh, feeding in, uh, on them. Also, uh, the huge meadows uh, are life for a lot of huge marine snails. There's a queen conch, which is a little south of here, and a horse conch. Horse conch is our state shell hunting in the uh, seagrass beds. So what threatens seagrass? Pollution, eutrophication, uh, clouds the water, they need clean water. Boating tears them up, they, they really don't recover from prop scars too well <clears throat> because those underground stems are analogous to a tree trunk and you cut them, you cut them. Uh, so they're fragile. Fragile ecosystems. Uh, so we need light, clean water, and uh, no wake zones. No wake zones. There's healthy seagrass and uh, damaged seagrass uh, images. Uh, that prop scar again, that will take years to cover up. Now, Tampa Bay and a lot of places through clean water acts have really made a comeback on our seagrass beds uh, because of uh, sewage treatment. The water is less eutrophic. Hard bottom communities are the last communities. Now we make artificial reefs, which are hard bottom. We have limestone outcrops, which we call Swiss cheese bottom. And that provides habitat for algae to grow on it and entire food chains to uh, live in the rocks and in the limestone outcrops. Uh, that's called the hard bottom community. 